Jack Benny's show was really quite easy to do. I'm talking now from the actor's standpoint. Obviously, the writing was meticulous. Jack honed a lot of that writing. He sat with the writers a great deal. Mm -hmm. He, uh, If it came down to a rock-bottom decision as to a joke in or out, it would be very often Jack's decision that made uh -huh. that happen. But for an actor, it was a very simple show to do. You'd go in, we'll say on Saturday, you'd read through once. Just sit down, read the script straight through, get up and leave, and you'd come back in on Sunday. You'd read once around the table, go and read it once on the mic, and that's all until showtime. Just that easy to do. So the whole uh, thing was really right in there with the writing. It well, was it was that, that and also <clears throat> that Jack knew his people, and they wrote for those people. Mm -hmm. Jack had a great thing that I don't think any other comic in the business had. If you were to pick up a Jack Benny script and read it, you'd say, well, wait a minute, where, where are Mr. Benny's jokes? Because Jack didn't do jokes. He did looks. He did takes. He fed, really, you the actor around him. That's mm -hmm. the way he conducted his show. The big jokes were in the hands of the people who surrounded him, which was most unusual. And it showed that he had tremendous confidence in himself. He surrounded himself with characters that people expected to hear also. When yeah. as soon as he said, oh, mister, people said, oh boy, here it comes. He's going to get it, you know? <laughs> yeah. And if he said, excuse me, and the fellow said, see, he says, oh boy, here it comes. Yeah. Now they're going to do that routine. The people were in on it, and I think they enjoyed being in on it. I guess the fact that the show stayed on top all the years that it did proved that. In early May 1944, Jack and the rest of his cast were traveling around military bases in the Pacific Northwest. On May 7th, they were at the Naval Air Station in Whidbey Island, Washington, as Dick Hames continued substituting for the now-departed Dennis Day. The rating for this episode was 20.1. Although lower than the season average, it was still tied for third overall, and first on Sunday evenings. The Grape Nuts and Grape Nuts Flakes program coming to you from the Naval Air Station, Whidbey Island, Washington, and starring Jack Benny. With Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dick Hames, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Gentlemen, America is up against a serious paper shortage right now, and we're all asked to do all we can to help. So don't throw out a single paper bag or one old newspaper or wrapping paper. Find out what the system for paper collection is in your neighborhood and get in there and pitch. Another way you can help is to buy as many foods as possible in larger packages instead of smaller ones. Or it takes less paper per pound to pack in the larger sizes. So next time you buy tempting, toasty brown grape nut flakes, Ask for the big 12-ounce economy size package. The 12-ounce carton of grape nuts actually uses a third less cardboard than the same amount of food packed in smaller boxes. And you save up to 14 cents on every dollar spent when you buy grape nut flakes regularly in the larger package instead of the smaller one. So remember, folks, ask for delicious, moldy-rich grape nut flakes in the big 12-ounce economy size package. gentlemen, we're broadcasting from the Naval Air Station on Whitby Island. And now, before introducing our star, let me tell you some facts about the naval background of his heroic family. Oh, Don, they don't care about that. But then they might, so go ahead and tell them. In 1789, there was Phineas J. Benny. Yes, sir, good old Phineas. In 1812, there was Abadiah J. Benny. Good old Abby. He was the only man to ride a torpedo side saddle. Poor fella, he never should have dug his spurs into it. <laughs> Continue, Don. In 1836, there was Fauntleroy J. Benny. Good old Fonty. In 1861, there was Cornelius J. Benny. Good old Corny. <laughs> and in the year 1872, another member of this great family was born, and here he is, Jack Benny. <laughs> Thank 
Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking. And, Don, where do you come off saying that I was born in 1872? I'm not that old, you know. But, Jack, you told me yourself. Tell these boys... That Don, you... I told you to tell them that I was steeped the Navy tradition. Steep, not too. <laughs> My goodness. Oh, I'm sorry, Jack, but I was carried away with the important men in your family. Oh, yes. Finney, Abby, Fonty, and Corny. What men? Well, they're all dead now, aren't they, Jack? All except Corny. He's writing for Fred Allen. Another... <laughs> Imagine, now imagine my great-grandfather writing for Alan. Now, wait a minute, Jack. I hear a lot of Fred's programs. I don't think his stuff is so old. You don't, eh? Well, Don, all I know is I read one of Alan's scripts, and the most modern words in it were thee, thou, and ye. <laughs> if thou knowest what I mean. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hi, you fellas. Hello, everybody. Gosh, Mary, you're just bubbling over. What are you, I mean, what are you, uh, uh, what, what are you so happy about? Well, Jack, when I was a little girl, I read the story of Robinson Crusoe. Robinson Crusoe? Yes. Ever since then, I've dreamed of being cast away on some deserted little spot far from civilization. And at last, here I am on Whidbey Island. <laughs> Yes, yes, it is a romantic uh, little place, isn't it? I'll say it is. You know, last night I was sitting in the moonlight with a bombardier, mm -hmm. and out of a clear sky I turned to him and said, you know, being on this island makes me wish I was Dorothy L'Amour. Really? Yeah. And he turned to me and said, Sister, you're not wishing any harder than I am. <laughs> well, how do you like that? Hey, Barry, these fellas up here are hard to please, aren't they? Oh, no, only uh, one out of a hundred is like that. How do you know? I was out with the other 99. <laughs> oh, then you must have gotten around. Have you been to the Green Gate? <laughs> huh? Have Na you been? 99 times. Mary, you're making this whole thing up. We've only been up here since... The... Come in. Hello, Mr. Benny. I'm Ruby Wagner, Mary Livingston, girlfriend from Vancouver. Oh, for heaven's sake. Are you still following Mary around? Jack, who is it? Mary! Ruby! Oh, Mary, Ruby, I'm so surprised to see you're still around here. I thought you'd surely gone home to Vancouver by this time. Not that I'm not glad to see you, but my... Girl! I'm in on our radio program all the time. Girlies! 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 Wait a minute, wait a minute! For heaven's sake, girls, knock it off, please. <laughs> now, Ruby, you promised that you'd forget all about Hollywood and go back to Vancouver. Last Sunday, you butted in and started imitating Catherine Hepburn. Catherine Hepburn? Yes. The calla lilies are in bloom again, rally they are. You haven't seen beautiful calla lilies until you see my calla lilies. Ruby. Come throw with me in the garden Ruby, and see please. my calla lilies. Uh, Ruby, Ru we heard about your calla lilies last week. They're beautiful, aren't they? <laughs> yes, now go back to Vancouver and forget about Hollywood. You know, we've got real stars there like Ingrid Bergman, Barbara Stanwyck, Claudette Colbert. And Betty Davis? Yes, Betty Davis. Of course I loved him, but even though I loved him, I killed him. <laughs> and I'm glad, 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 glad you're here. And if I had the opportunity again, I'd kill him again. Perfect. Of course I would, and I'd be glad Kiddo. again. Glad, glad that you're here. Ruby, that's enough. Now, will you please go? No, of course I'll go. I'll be glad to go. Glad, glad, glad. And if you ask me to go again, I'll be glad to go again. Ruby! the silliest person I ever met. Mary, will you try to do something about her? Yes, Jack, I'll be glad, glad, glad. You've asked me to do it again, I'll be glad again, glad, glad, glad again, glad again. Now glad stop again. with that. It's all your fault she's following us around. Of all the girls in Vancouver, you had to go to school with her. I couldn't help it. She was a teacher. <laughs> oh, well, no wonder she's so apple happy. <laughs> now, let's see. What was I going to do? Oh, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, as I announced last week, 
We're finishing out this season with guest singers. And tonight, I'd like to present one of the stars of the new 20th Century Fox picture, Four Gills in the Jeep. Dick Haynes, who will sing long ago and far away. Very good, Dick, and I want to thank you for leading off our parade of guest singers. Well, you're very welcome, Jack. Uh, by the way, Dick, there's something I'd like to ask you. Would you consider uh, being a regular member of my program? Well, I don't know, Jack. It'll depend largely on the salary. Uh, uh, salary? Well, goodbye, Dick. It was nice knowing you. <laughs> Mary, stay out of it. Well, Dick, I don't know much about money matters, and I certainly wouldn't want to offend you by offering you too little. So what do you think would be a fair salary? Well, I don't know, Jack. What were you paying Dennis? Uh, Dennis? Uh, $35 a week. <laughs> but then, you must remember, Dennis was with me five years. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's quite a long time, you know. Well, what did Dennis get the first year? The Purple Heart. <laughs> Mary, will you please be quiet? Dick and I are talking business. Well, uh, what do you say, Dick? Well, I don't know, Jack. $35 a week isn't quite the figure I had in mind. Oh, you mean, uh, you mean you'd want more than that? Well, yes. A little more. Well, I think we could talk about it. Uh, just what do you expect? $1,000? Yes! <laughs> A thousand dollars. Jack, that isn't so high. It isn't, eh? You made his nose bleed. <laughs> did not. Well, oh. Dick. <laughs> oh, they did not. It was nice of you to come up here to Seattle, and maybe some other time we'll be... Excuse me. Come in. Yes, what is it? My name is John Krauss, and I'm looking for my sweetheart. She followed your show here from Vancouver. Oh, you mean Ruby Wagner. She was here a few minutes ago. I've got to get her back. I've been in love with her ever since the day I met her. It was so romantic. Look, I wish you'd take her back because... I'll never forget how we met. I was oh. standing on a street corner, and I whistled at a beautiful girl, and I got Ruby instead. <laughs> well, look, well, I'll help you get and her now back. now my Ruby is gone. She wants to become a big success like our friend Mary Livingston. John. So look. she left me. We were so happy together. I know. And I now she's can... gone. She's gone. You gotta make her come back to me. You gotta please, please, please. <laughs> Control you. I'm Mr. Benny, not Mr. Anthony. <laughs> My goodness. I'm 
I'm sorry if I broke down. Have you got a handkerchief, please? Yes, here. Thanks. My shoes are awful dusty. <laughs> now, just a minute. I didn't give you my handkerchief to polish your shoes. Well, gee whiz, if I find Ruby, do you want me to look like a slob? That little handkerchief won't help, believe me. Imagine Ruby wanting to go to Hollywood to be an actress. She ain't got no talent and she ought to come home. You're absolutely right. Why, she has no more chance of being Katherine Hepburn than you have of being another Jimmy Durante. Jimmy Durante? Yeah. <laughs> Listen to this. I'm mortified, I say. I'm mortified. They won't put me in there. John. Hey, but where's the logic? Now, we hit you over the head. John. You're not me, say. Consider yourself logic. John. I'm mortified, I tell you. <laughs> Sister won't be out with that and get out of here. What did you say, Junior? I said, get out of here. That's my boy, you said that. Never mind, go. What a couple they'll make, Katherine Hepburn and Jimmy Durandy. I don't know why it is that everybody wants to be a movie actor. Ah, oh, you're right, Jack. It's so ridiculous. I don't see why people can't be happy just being what they are. Yeah. That guy's as much like Durante as you are like Boyer. Charles Boyer? Yes. Come with me to the camp. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Oh, yes, yes. Come with me. My little pigeon and I will buy you the most wonderful jewels in the world. A lustrous spring of grape knots. What? Toasty brown grape knots. Sweet as a nut and malty rich. <laughs> Forgive me if I sound too passionate. Don, this is going too far. Why a heavy? Now, Don, cut it out. We've had enough imitations here. But grape nuts is not oh. an imitation. It's the real thing. Don, I told you to stop it. You're not Charles Boyer. Although I bet the women wish you were. You really think so, Jack? Yeah, that would be enough to go around. <laughs> Imagine, Fatty Boyer. <laughs> now, look, let's stop all this nonsense. We're here to entertain the boys. Unless someone can imitate Ann Sheridan, cut it out. Hey, if it's glamour you're looking for, Jackson, I'm loaded. Hiya, fellas. <laughs> Phil, now that you've made that great big noisy entrance, let me tell you something. There's nothing glamorous about you. Oh, there ain't, huh? No. What are you talking about? I was over to the Waves Barracks, and they've got a great big picture of me up on the wall. Wait a minute. What were you doing in the Waves Barracks? Putting up my picture. <laughs> That's what I thought. Say, Phil, what does Alice write you about the new baby? Oh, the baby? Oh, uh, she's a cute little thing, and Alice says she resembles me so much, we're just like twins. Really? Yeah, Alice says that even when the kid cries, it sounds like that's what I like about the sound. <laughs> well, don't worry. She'll grow out of it. Yeah. And now that you're here, Phil, how about playing a band number? Okay, I'll tell you what, Jackson. I'm going to play Alabama Bound. You know, that's from uh, Eddie Cantor's new picture, uh, Show Business. Well, it's a swell time to do it, Phil, because tonight... Wait a minute, I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you called, Rochester. Did you get everything packed? Everything, boss. And already checked out of the hotel. Good. But you know, Mr. Benny, you ought to consider the purchase of some new luggage. Well, what's wrong with the luggage I have? Well, I feel so silly walking through the lobby with two bird cages full of socks. <laughs> oh, you do, huh? The birds don't like it either. <laughs> Now, don't be ridiculous. And another thing, boss, that old suitcase of yours broke open right in the middle of the lobby, and man, what a mess. You mean my things fell out? Part of yours and part of mine. <laughs> well, that's embarrassing. Did you pick them up? I picked up yours. Mine soaked right into the road. <laughs> Soaked 
into the rock? <laughs> what are you laughing at? I know a vacuum cleaner that's going to have an awful hangover tomorrow. <laughs> well, I don't care about that. Did you pick up everything that belongs to me? Everything but your toupee. My toupee? What happened to that? Some nearside woman put a leash on it and let it away. <laughs> What? Last time I saw it, it won a blue ribbon at the dog show. <laughs> well, it's your fault it's lost, and I'm going to take it out of your salary. Oh, not this week, boss. You know, yesterday was the Kentucky Derby, and I made a little wager. Oh, so you lost again, eh? When did your horse come in? In the pool of the evening. <laughs> well, you're not going to get any sympathy from me in Rochester. I'll meet you at the station right after the broadcast. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? I just got a letter from home, and we ought to be getting back there. Why? The canna lilies are in bloom again. Rarely they are. Those great big beautiful canna lilies. Never mind that. Goodbye. <laughs> when will that guy ever learn? Oh, well, go ahead and play, Phil. Go ahead. <laughs> Cantor's new picture, and congratulations, Eddie, on your 35th year in show business. Say, Jackson, do you mind if I leave right after the show? Why? Well, one of the aviators told me as soon as the program's over, he's going to take me to see a Lynx trainer. Well, that sounds interesting. Yeah, I've always wanted to meet the guy that trains them Lynx. <laughs> Phil, a Lynx trainer is not someone who trains animals. A Lynx trainer is, a um, is, a uh, Don. Don, you tell him what a Lynx trainer is. Okay. Well, you see, Phil, a link trainer is a mechanical device that's used to teach aviators blind flying. Yes, yes, that's it. <laughs> see, Don is smart, aren't you, Jack? <laughs> yeah. In fact, Phil, it's one of the greatest inventions since Orville and Wilbur Wright invented the airplane. Orville and Wilbur Wright? Yes, Phil. And now, since we're playing here at a naval air station, let's give the boys our version of the invention of the airplane. Take it, Don. In the year 1903, two brothers, Orville and Wilbur, lived in obscurity, not knowing that someday they would become world-famous inventors. One day, early in the afternoon, Orville was sitting at his workbench while Wilbur was standing by the window, staring out into space, thinking, thinking, thinking. Wilbur, Wilbur, what are you thinking about? I don't know, Orville. I'm just looking out the window, watching them birds fly up to their nest. Now, say, Orville, I was just wondering, why can't people do what the birds do? Now, hold on, Wilbur. Eggs ain't that expensive. <laughs> Not yet. Oh, I don't mean that, Orville. I mean, why can't we fly like a bird? Fly like a bird? Wilbur, sometimes you get the darndest ideas. Come in. Hello, boy. Well, well, if it ain't Kitty Hawk. <laughs> you boys look busy. What are you inventing today? You wouldn't believe it, Kitty, but Wilbur here is talking about inventing a contraption that'll make a man fly like a bird. Man fly like a bird up in the air? Why, sure. sure. Oh, what's the use of being up there? Everything you want is down here. How do you know? You ain't been up there. Anyway, Kitty, I'm going to stick with Wilbur. If he wants to invent a flying machine, I'm with him. That a boy, Orville. Now, let's get busy. When we build this machine, we're going to call it the aerial plane. And I got a great idea. You know those horse-drawn trolley cars they got now? Yeah. Well, we'll invent a horse-drawn aerial plane. 
A horse-drawn aeroplane? How in the world are you going to keep a horse up in the air? Oh, Kitty, listen. We're going to have enough trouble trying to keep up the aeroplane. The horse is just going to have to look out for himself. <laughs> Right, Kitty, we're going to build this flying machine right here and now. <laughs> well, there it is. <clears throat> All finished. How'd you do it so fast? Used to work at Boeing. <laughs> Let's see, all we got to do now is... I'll take it, Wilbur, I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Orville! This is Alexander Graham Bell. Oh, hello, Alex. What's up? Plenty. You'll never guess what I did this morning. What? I invented the telephone. <laughs> you did? Well, doggone, Alex. We're your best friends. Why didn't you call us sooner? I tried to, but there was a two-hour delay between Seattle and Whidbey Island. <laughs> well, we're busy. Can't talk to you now, Alex. Goodbye. Goodbye. You know, Wilbur, Alex Bell just invented the telephone, but I don't think it'll ever work. Oh, come on, R. Bill. Now, stop the fooling around. Let's get on with this aerial plane. Let's get it outdoors. Okay, you lift up the tail. I'll carry the fuselage in. Let's go. Easy there, easy. Easy does her. Here we are. Okay, now we're ready for the experiment. Here's the crank handle, Wilbur. I'll get in. You wind her up. Hey, wait a minute, R. Bill. You can't fly that thing. Why not? You ain't got no priority. <laughs> Priority? What's that? That's something you got to get before they can take it away from you. No. Well, I'll get one later. Okay, Wilbur, take the crank handle and wind her up. Okay, you ready? Ready. There you are. She's all wound up. Okay, let her go. She's only a bird in a gilded cage, a beautiful thing. Hmm. I knew we shouldn't have used the motor out of that old phonograph. <laughs> oh, it didn't hurt nothing, Orville. Just take the record out. Okay. There. Now, Wilbur, give that propeller a spin and see what happens. Okay. Contact. Contact. <laughs> Again, Wilbur. Okay. Orville, contact. Contact. It's a running. Everybody in. Come on, Kitty. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Orville, contact. Contact. It's a running. Everybody in. Come on, Kitty. Okay. Here we go. What do we do now? Fire again, Wilbur. If it won't work now, we'll just invent the parachute. Let somebody else worry about this. <laughs> Go ahead, contact. Contact. Okay, here we go. Hey, we're going up. Yeah, we're flying. Yippee, yippee, Wilbur. We're a success. She flies. Yes, sir, Reed. Now let's take her down and tell the world we invented the aerial plane. Okay, take her down. Wilbur, you made a perfect landing. Right in somebody's backyard. That's right, we did. Oh, here comes somebody. Let's get out of here. You landed right here, my Calla Lilies. You spoiled my great big beautiful Calla Lilies radio, dear. Of course I did, and I'm glad, glad, glad. Do you hear? I'm glad I did. If I land again, I'll do it again. I'll do it again. Right here. And now, friends, just a few words about crisp, crunchy, marley rich grape nuts. Uh, say, Mr. Wilson. Oh, it's you, Ruby. Yeah, do you think I ought to go back to my boyfriend? Now, uh, Ruby, I'm really not qualified to give advice to the lovelorn. And now, friends, about grape nuts. Why, well, you're always giving advice. Oh, I'm not. You are. You advise people to eat grape nuts. That's not advice to the lovelorn. And now... It is. It isn't. And now, friends... You say eat a good breakfast, do a better job. I know I do, but what well, is... Well, if my boyfriend ate a good breakfast, maybe he could do a better job of persuading me to go back home, see? Well, Ruby, who would have believed it? You're right. I know, I usually 
Jim's in. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. But, friends, it is true. Eat a good breakfast, you'll do a better job. And if you include baldy rich grape nuts in your breakfast, you'll be doing yourself a big favor. For grape nuts provide all-around nourishment, whole grain nourishment. One kind of nourishment nutrition experts say we need every day. Iron, niacin, vitamin B1 plus protein. So give yourself a swell start for the day and make tempting sweet as a nut grape nut your feature breakfast day. Good night, folks. I met a friend. She said to me, try grape nut sweet meal and you'll be delighted with this grand new treat. It's luscious and it's all whole.